continue on week two of evangelism. If you guys remember last week, it was our kind of intro into evangelism. I said we kind of pick up this week and uh, start to go over some more of the kind of just the intro lessons to evangelism. Eventually, we're going to get to. Yeah, eventually, we're going to get to um, uh, back to the Bible. Back to the Bible is the program that we're going that I'm going to teach you as we go through these coming weeks. And uh, here soon, we'll, after we do more of the intro uh, to uh, back to the Bible, we're going to uh, I'm going to conduct the study with you being the prospect, right? Uh, and just to show you how easy uh, it is and how anybody can do it. You don't have to have a lot of depth of knowledge to be able to to use these programs. Uh, and if you're not sure what it is, they come like this, right? This is for those of us who are optically challenged, right? And uh, they have the large print version, but they also have the smaller ones, right? You know what I mean? For those who, who aren't, it's the same same exact thing. It just ones in a larger print. They're, you could buy them. I think they're a dollar. You know, maybe a dollar and a quarter, right? And so, for one cup of coffee that we anybody here ever go to the you know Third drive through and get a cup of coffee? Third of a cup of coffee. Two ninety nine for a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. Well, so what I'm saying though is, for a cup of coffee, you can buy one of the packets. And it gives you all three lessons, right? And so it's not something that's not affordable. It's not something that's going to cost us a lot of money. Um, and so the great thing about this program is, and as I'm going to preface this, I'm showing you something that I use. But I've also used Fishers to Men. I've also used Open Bible. There's, there's many different tools. And it doesn't matter which tool that you use. They're all going to uh, come about the same, uh, the, the, same, result. the same result, the same conclusion, right? Uh, souls uh, coming into the kingdom. So if you have a different program, we're going to give you uh, principles and things to be able to do during those studies, how to answer the, how to answer the questions. Anybody here, you're, you're focused on lesson one, it starts to get into authority in the church. There's other topics, but let's just say the first one, authority in religion, right? But then somebody, you know, their, their mind's going all over the place, and they have questions, and you're on authority in religion. Are you guys one of those ones that don't have instrumental music, right? Do you guys not have instruments? Is that your church, right? But you're not talking about that, right? So we're going to talk about how to answer those questions. Uh, and how, and actually how to defer and not answer those questions, actually, I should say. So uh, they also have these other three supplemental little studies, also little pamphlets that are the same thing. You can get all three of them for a cup of coffee. Uh, and then when you look at these three different things, there's a survey that you also can get. That's something that you just keep on your computer and you print out. It's 15 questions. But as you go over these 15 questions, it's not like they have to write a long answer out. The answers to the questions are yes, no, or unsure, right? It literally would take you know less than a minute or two for them to fill out the survey because before you start to uh, study with somebody, if they don't know much about Almighty God, right, and or they may not even believe in God, what what good does it help them with authority and religion, right? It doesn't do much good if they don't believe in God. So there's this one, the very first one, affirmation for God, right? And it gives you basically, it's a, a condensed version to help somebody to know that there's evidence for God, that you can believe in God, you can know that God exists. Uh, the second one, uh, what if they're, they, they, you do the survey and they're not really sure uh, as to, is the Bible actually God's word? Well, guess what? You don't, go, you don't continue with the study. Instead, you use this one, right? And it's going to show them uh, and teach them that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And then thirdly, I think most people know who Christ is, uh, but maybe they know the name, maybe they, they've heard uh, about Christ you know, through Christmas and, and just the Christianity, but they don't know a whole lot about him. Who's Christ, right? So there's, a, there's, so there's three different supplemental things that you can use to help somebody. And then once they understand who God is, understand who Jesus is, understand inspiration of scripture, now you're ready to sit down, right? And then follow these three little, the three steps. And that's all it is, it's three studies. And so this is the program that as, as we go through these coming weeks, we're going to start to look more and more into. Okay? Any thoughts or questions uh, before we could, uh, continue on? 
Yeah, does that mean that you're buying us all a cup of coffee? No, I'm not buying you all a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> this is something that originally I was going to ask the elders to uh, invest in, but I don't, I don't want that to happen on this, in, in this instance, right? Because sometimes, I believe, isn't it the truth that when you spend sometimes some of your own money, you're more apt to do what? <laughs> Utilize it, right? But if somebody else's money... Eh, just throw it in the closet or maybe eventually it's sitting there collecting dust and you, and you drop it in the garbage can. So I appreciate the question, but that's something that it's literally, you could get all three of them for a cup of coffee. So where do you get these um, Glad Tidings Publishing. Uh, there's a, you can get them on World Video Bible School's website, Glad Tidings Publishing, if you're not sure who they are. They're affiliated with House to House. You got, I think everybody here has heard of House to House, Heart, I think Heart to Heart, I think it is. Um, and it for, for many years here, uh, before I was here, the congregation mailed those out. And it is a great tool. Um, and so they have, they have a whole, now there is something that I may speak to the elders too that we can maybe help the congregation with, and that is some of the Heart to Hearts. Um, so that way you have something also to leave behind where we don't have to do the mailing, but you can have it <laughs> shipped here to the uh, congregation. It's a box of them, and it'll have nice articles. Uh, it'll have all of our information on there, our, you know, our worship times, our Bible study times, who the leadership is, uh, speaks about the Lincoln Park Church of Christ. So they have, they've actually developed an entire system. And I, there's a book, actually, even that you can get. It's $15, but it's all of these different charts. So that way, when you're sitting down with somebody, you have visuals that will help them to see. Because sometimes, is it a, don't visuals sometimes uh, help for somebody to understand and see? So there are other tools that, go, that goes along with this. And so um, this congregation, and I think it's Alabama, has done a, a wonderful job of putting together a whole system, right? Um, there's uh, contact cards, right, that you can break down all their information and then keep track of where they're at. Uh, there's other cards, you know what I mean, blessing cards that you could send out, you know what I mean, to, to friends and family members um, with, uh, with invitations. And so we'll, we'll get more into that. I just wanted to let you know, as we go through this intro into evangelism, these are, this is the program that we're going to utilize. But if you have a different program, I know like Russ has a program that he utilizes. Hey, if it's working for you, by all means, continue to use it. You know what I mean? But this, this this study is still going to give us some evangelism principles that apply to no matter what system, what tool you use, right? Because isn't the end goal still the same, right? End goal still the same. All right, thoughts, questions before we get, uh, really jump into today's uh, lesson? No? Uh, Lewis? Yeah, house to house, and it was, we, we did use that. Yeah. Darren Smith, and he was maintaining it. Yeah. We need somebody to take over that program again because it was effective. Yeah. And then we did have the extra ones that we gave out and in the back of the auditorium. Yeah. As we get into this evangelism yeah. program, that is something, an opportunity for some group or yeah. some persons to do. It's not a burden, for some, yeah. but it's, it's something that we can do. Yeah. And, you know, earlier on in my faith, when I fully didn't understand what the expectation was of myself, I used to, th I used to think, man, this door knocking thing, it's, it seems like a waste of time. You know what I mean? It, you know, I don't know of anybody who's been converted from a door knocking campaign. I'm sure there has been some, you know what I mean? Uh, but it's not many. But then as I grow in and, and, and learned, and as I understood really what my, my God-given primary mission is as a Christian, it's to evangelize the world. So if I go and knock on a house, and uh, knock on a door, and I give them a copy of House to House, Heart to Heart, and it's got God-based information. It's got, you know, the plan of salvation in there, and it's got articles that are going to, to lead them towards Christ, right? Uh, isn't that still part of what God's called us to do? When Remember I said I don't like the word preach that we see in the Bible because that's a secondary definition, uh, a secondary uh, term, but really proclaim. So when we proclaim the gospel, when we take the gospel out, and we invite people uh, uh, to, to want to know more about Jesus, and we ask them for a study. We, uh, we give them information so they can know, know more about God. Haven't you actually fulfilled what God has asked you to do? Remember when he set out the disciples two by two? He said, go into the towns and the villages, right? Teach them and, and, and preach to them, proclaim to them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Uh, and then he says, those houses that won't receive you, 
Dust your sandals off and move on. He didn't say set up a debate stage and in and, and, and the middle of the town hall and in the middle of, of, of the town and, and continue to argue and debate with them. No, he said move on to the next house and the next house and the next house. You just have to give them the message, right? And that's what we started to talk about last week. That is our primary reason for existing. You never know when just planting the seed. A week later, three years later when they're cleaning yes. out the drawer and they run across that in a time of, of their need. Yeah. Sorrow, they have something to turn to. You and just never know. Understand this too, that the Great Commission, that's not our purpose, right? It's our purpose, it's our it's our reason for existence, but it's God's purpose, right? And when we do God's will, doesn't God bless his faithful children to bring about his will, right? If you think about all the times that uh, the you look at Hebrews chapter eleven, right? And all of those men and women who are mentioned, when they went out and they did what God had called them to do, without even full understanding of exactly what they were doing or what the end game was, God blessed them in all that they did, right? The Israelites, when they were faithful and obedient unto God, they had a wonderful existence, okay? Us Christians can have that same thing, right? And so it's not about you to convert people. The conversion falls on God, and it falls on the Word of God. The power to convert somebody is in the Word of God, not in your fancy stories, not in your oratory skills, right? Not in your illustrations, not in your little jokes, right? The power to convert is in the Word of God. And that's what God, he calls us to do. He said, just go, tell people about my love. Tell people about my son. Judy. And just to carry it one step further, it's twofold. We're not just doing what God, what we've been asked to do, what we've been told to do. Yep. We should be doing what we want to do. Yeah. Because we hope maybe that person will be a recipient. Amen. Because anybody, yep. we hope, I mean, we're supposed to be doing it out of our own love for others also, yeah. for every other soul on this earth, especially those that aren't saved. Absolutely. Uh, so last week uh, we, we, we went over 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, right? We talked about how even the Apostle Paul told Timothy, hey, I need you to go out. I need you to find other faithful men, and I need you to teach them what I taught you, right? And so they could do what? Teach others. So they could go and teach others. And then you have literally this just the, a continuing uh, uh, process that's taking place of other people seeking out other faithful people, other people who have the desire to want to know more about God, and then you teach them. And if you're doing your job right, then they should then be going out and making disciples. There should be a constant uh, stream of disciple making. And that falls on every single Christian. And we've used, I've said it last week, we use oftentimes the excuse, but that's not my gift. That's not my talent. And I'm going to get into that here in a few minutes because we use it as a crutch. We use it as an excuse for not doing the very thing that God asked us to do. Do you guys agree? All of our uh, activities here at Lincoln Park, uh, all of the, you know, what Matt just has done, right? He was a Healing Hands International. What he had just gone and done and the programs that they offer, they're wonderful. Right? They can help people. We should help people, but that's secondary. Right? The very first reason they need to be there is what? Reach out and teach. Reach out and teach. Proclaim the gospel. Right? Teach people about Jesus Christ. And so as we get into this lesson today, you're going to see how this comes about. When we do what we're supposed to do, God will give us opportunities yeah. to do that job. He's going yeah. to send people to you. Or he'll give you opportunities to do that. Yeah. So that's the other part we sometimes forget. If you are doing what you're supposed to do, yep. God will make a way for you to do it. Absolutely. So I have some good examples of what this is going to look like. So, Lewis, that's a good transition. So this morning, now we're going to continue on. And, you know, do you, would you agree how you, look at a, how you look at yourself, how you view yourself? Do you think that's important? Right? If you think of yourself as unimportant, if you think of yourself as, well, not very smart, if you think of yourself as, well, I don't really have much to offer, right? How do you think that's going to play out, not only just in your mindset, but just in your life? Not well. Not well? What are you going to say? Sluggish. Sluggish, right? What's the, what, what do you think the chances of you accomplishing much are? Right? 
probably not very good because you don't think you've got anything to offer anybody anyways. I'm not very smart. I don't really have many gifts. You know, I, I'm not good at talking people. I'm not good at talking to people. And so, you know, there's, I don't, you know, I'll come to church, but I don't, I don't, there's not a whole lot I can do, I don't think. I want you to remember something. Do you think that when you open your Bibles and you study the scriptures, do you think defeatism has it ever appeared? Has it ever re reared its ugly head in scripture? You guys ever hear of Moses? Why do I bring up Moses' name? Somebody raise your hand. Diane? Because he didn't feel that he was a good speaker, so he, for whatever reason, if he had a stutter or whatever, yeah. Yeah. He, he wanted somebody to help him. Yeah, he wanted somebody to help him. Mm -hmm. You say the same thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you think about Moses for a second, right? Defeatism, there's dozens of examples that you can give as you go throughout Scripture. I'm only going to give you three. So in Numbers chapter 13, let's open our Bibles. Numbers chapter 13. The voices of the defeatism and having that defeatist type attitude, they're well pronounced throughout Scripture. Numbers chapter 13. All right, Numbers chapter 13. Somebody read verse 31 through 33. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Okay. So in context here, we know that, didn't Moses send out 12 spies? Right? He, they sent out 12 spies. They go, they were in the land. I think they were in the land for like 40 days or something, right? Uh, they're in the land. They come back, and 10 of the 12 spies, they give such a negative report. They say, we are not able to go up against these people. Are you crazy? Did you see them? We're like grasshoppers. I was cutting the grass the other day, and I haven't seen one in a while, but they're boop, right in front of me. There's a grasshopper, right? Can, so, so you see the, right, the, the significance of it, right? We're just like insects in, in, in the sight of these people. Well, there's no way that we could, uh, we could do this. We, we'd be better off going back, to, going back to, to, to Egypt. And so, brethren, these ten spies, they come back, they give the report, not just to, to Moses, right, but they give it to their families. And they give it to the other church leaders and the other brethren. And these ten spies discourage the people so much with their defeatist type attitude that they were not able, that they would not be able to go in and to conquer and to settle into the land. Right? What's the next example? You guys remember in Matthew 25, there's that, the man of one talent. You don't have to turn there. Matthew chapter 25, the man of one talent. You guys know the story, right? And what do we see here? He says, I was afraid, and I went, and I hid my talents in the ground. And so this is a man who felt, listen, there, there's, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at anything. And I'm just going to you know, bury my talent in the ground. And the sad thing is that he buries his talent. He never even tried. Isn't it one thing to try and to fail? But at least you gave it your best effort. But you came up short, right? Maybe you, fall, maybe you failed in this, uh, in this instance. If he had tried and failed, that's one thing. But God told him to not even try is inexcusable. It is inexcusable. He says, you are a wicked and lazy servant. I wonder if we never even tried to proclaim the love of God, proclaim the gospel, Proclaim the good news. But I show up every Sunday for service. Do you think I could be that wicked and lazy servant? I know we don't like to think about it, but God said, go. Proclaim. Tell them about my son. Tell them about my love. Tell them how I so loved the world that I gave my only begotten son. That who believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Brethren, I wonder if God would say to any of us, you wicked and lazy servant, you didn't even try, and that is inexcusable. Lewis. In each of those cases, God doubled or 
how many fold the ones who actually did something. Yeah. And that lesson was, you had one talent, I would have doubled that if you'd gone out and done it. Yeah. I think we could get that conclusion that God was going to help that one talented person. Absolutely. What about another example? In Exodus, back in Exodus 14, we see that Israel's coming out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 14, let's read verse 11 and 12. Exodus chapter 14, somebody read verse 11 and 12. Then they said to Moses, It is because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Yeah. I love verse 11. Is it because there's no graves in, in, in Egypt that you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? Didn't we just tell you to leave us alone? I, let us just be slaves for the rest of our, our, our existence. But what do we see as we continue to read and to understand this story? With God's help, didn't God, with, uh, didn't the Israelites with God's help defeat the Egyptians? The Israelites were brought and led to safety through the Red Sea and were given deliverance. Because God was going to, God will and always will fulfill his purpose. All right? Brothers and sisters, in our evangelistic efforts, isn't God the one who gives the increase? So is the increase based on your talent and your gifts, or is the increase based on your willingness to just simply do what God calls you to do? Barb? I was going to say, um, the Israelites are complaining, why didn't you just leave us there to die instead of dying in the wilderness? Well, they predicted their own fate because yes. of their continued disobedience to God. That's exactly what happened to every one of them. Yeah, continued disobedience, the continued complaining and the grumbling, and God finally said, enough is enough. Right? And so, brother, when we look at this, people with defeatist attitudes throughout history have forgotten that God has <laughs> always helped the faithful fulfill his purpose. Amen. Every time. Mm -hmm. you know, I just wanted to bring up, I think it goes back to your trust in God, right? Trust, because yes. That, that's, the, that's the key issue because yeah. Proverbs 3 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart yeah. and lean not to your own understanding. Yep. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. Amen. And I think it comes back to, to trust. If you don't have the trust in God, to have yeah. faith in him, that where you fall short, you know that he's going to strengthen you and give you the words to speak and the things to do, then you're not going to go for it because you don't have faith. Yeah, because you don't have God. the faith. You don't have the trust. Amen. And so we have to understand that God has always, in every instance that you go through and you look at the biblical record, the Old and New Testament, right? Uh, all three dispensations. Didn't even Cain, didn't going all the way back to the beginning, didn't God say, listen, I gave you and your brother instruction. And it doesn't say that, but we know he must have gave instructions because he tells them, if you do what you're supposed to do, won't it be well with you? Right? And so, brethren, God says, do what is required of you, and I will bless you. Do what is required of you, of you and I will make sure that you fulfill the purpose in which I give. You guys remember Gideon, right? And he had the thousands, and then he whittled it down and whittled it down and whittled it down to like 300. That was going to go up against the, the what, 180,000, I think it was. And they were like, you know, like, what is going on, right? But they remembered. Gideon had to remember, and he had to be shown and convinced by God that, listen, it's not about you. It's not about the 300. I whittled it down on purpose to let you know the victory is not yours, the victory is mine. And so if you do what I require of you, I will bless your efforts. And that's what God is asking us to do. Brothers and sisters, Christianity is a taught religion. Amen? Amen. It's a taught religion. Jeremiah talks about this, you know, you know uh, back in th Jeremiah 31, 34. He says, you know, no longer will you tell, tell your neighbors to know me, for they will all know me. How will they all know me? Because his disciples are supposed to go out and tell people about him. You don't have to preach book, chapter, verse. You don't even have to be able to, in the beginning, to be able to feel comfortable doing the Bible studies. We're going to strengthen you. 
We're going to encourage you. We're going to teach you. And then eventually you have to take it upon yourself to study. And to do God's will, you have to understand what the will is. And so Christianity is a taught religion. Let's open our Bibles to the New Testament. John chapter 6. I want us to look at verse 44 and 45. John chapter 6, verse 44 and 45. Well, have somebody read that for me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It was written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Okay. What did the Holy Spirit just say through the Apostle John? that they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard, everyone who has learned from the Father comes to the Son. Right? And so, brother, Psalms 119, we're not going to turn there, but you guys have seen Psalm 119 before. It also discusses this idea that in order to know the will of God, in order to be able to do the will of God, you have to be taught the will of God. And so... Being taught of God, it doesn't mean that you're going to hear God's voice in your head. No longer do we have the visions and the dreams, right? No longer are uh, angels coming uh, and prophets coming to give us additional revelation from Almighty God. And so, brethren, being taught of God doesn't mean hearing his voice in your head. It means loving the law of God. It means meditating on the law of God. Observing and gaining understanding from his word and from his teachings. Does that take effort? Yes. Yeah. Have you ever heard, and I know this is a rhetorical question because we know the answer, in the church, have you ever met adult Christians who sit in pews and you ask them, hey, would you be willing to teach the little kids Bible would you get involved in the education of our children get involved in the education of our adults oh I, I don't know enough I don't feel comfortable I, I don't know I don't, I don't know enough <laughs> and then two years go by three years go by hey I, you know, I, would you be willing to get involved in the education of our children would you be involved in teaching a women's class or, or a men's class oh I, I, I don't know enough I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I can do that I don't think I'm ready for that and then five years go by and ten years go by. Anybody here ever have that conversation? Amen. And I know it's a rhetorical question because we all know the answer to it. Are you like that wicked servant who buried his talent? You see, Christianity, I just showed you in Scripture, is a taught religion. In order to learn something new, well, what must one do? Somebody raise your hand. It's not a difficult question. In order to learn something new, new what must one do? Judy or Barb? Study. Study? Right? So as we think about this here this morning, Romans 10 and 17 says, faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. We have to hear in order to learn, right? And so no one is born, no one is born a natural born soul winner, right? Not one person has ever been born a soul winner. What do I mean by soul winner? Nobody has ever been born with special gifts for evangelism. Brethren, when you think about that, there are some who seem to be talented in public speaking, some who seem to be more talented in public, in public speaking, but they're not born that way. Somewhere along the line, they practiced different things. They took... Um, interest in different things that were going to help to develop them, right, into the individual that you see before you, that you think, wow, they're a good public speaker. Wow, they really know the scriptures. Well, were they born that way? Or did they actually, somewhere along the line, have to invest time and effort into learning the craft? David, the word is desire. Whatever you desire, you go after or you seek after, yeah. whatever it may be. Absolutely. You know, 
<clears throat> we've all been to funerals. We've all talked about people who are different. Uh, who, who after they have died, we talk about their life. We talk about their uh, you know their their actions. We talk about their family. Talk about their careers. Right? You know, we hear about it all the time. I read of mechanics and pilots and executives and tradespeople dying, but I never hear about them being born. Who here is born a pilot? Right? Who here was born an engineer? Who here was born a minister? Right? Not a single individual. And the point I'm trying to make is that means these people had an interest, found something that they were interested in, that they desired, and they spent many years of their life developing skills to become what you know them to be. I think that's one of the reasons that is a qualification of an elder. Yeah. You have to desire that position. Desire the position. And then also be able to teach. Right? I've known elders, and I know today elders who are in positions who are unable to teach. You should never have been an elder. Congregation erred in putting that individual as an elder. Because what is the I mean, there's, there's lots of roles that elders fulfill, but what is the main role that an elder fulfills? To spiritually protect and feed the flock. Spiritually protect and feed the flock. That's their main reason for existing. Now, they have other things that they do, but that's their primary thing, right? So God has commanded us, ordinary people, God has commanded ordinary people to do what? To preach the gospel to the world. We know this because last week we talked about Matthew chapter 28. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And then doing what? <clears throat> then you continue to strengthen them by teaching them and helping them to mature in their faith. He says, you teach them not just some of the things, teach them all that I commanded you. You don't have to be that person, though, that is actually able to teach them all. I just need every one of you to be able to pro have the ability to proclaim the reason why you became a Christian. And if you don't know why you became a Christian, I wonder if you're a Christian. Because how did you get to the water? Did, didn't you have to have a belief? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Well, if you believe that he was the Son of God, what else do you know about Jesus? Do you know about his resurrection? Right? Do you know about his life and ministry? Do you know about the miracles that he performed to prove who he said he was? Do you see that when now when you look at Acts and you get to like Acts chapter uh, 8, and it says in, in the church was uh, uh, chapter 9, and the church was being persecuted. And as they were being persecuted, the church went out and they proclaimed the good news. They proclaimed the gospel, right? They didn't have the physical gospels. They weren't sitting down and saying, let me teach you from the parables in Matthew. No, they were just going out telling people about Jesus. Telling people about his love and, and, and what God has done for you. Brother, that's, that's our mission. Thoughts or, process, thoughts or comments? Uh, Luana and then Lewis. I just want to say, I think sometimes we just as human beings, we put a lot of emphasis, and I think undue emphasis, on things like our public speaking ability and yeah. things like that. Because that can become, what am I going to say? That's very fleshly, right? We, yeah. we're, looking, we're thinking about how we look to people yeah. or things like that. And I think that sometimes we can focus on that more than focusing on what we're actually supposed to be doing. Because at the end of the day, whether someone thinks that I make eloquent speeches and yeah. all of this is not as important as what the information is that I'm conveying, yeah. right? Amen. And I think that we don't, we, we think about that flesh yeah. side too much, like, oh, I can't speak like this person or this, that, and other, yeah. that's really not required. So we, we put too much emphasis on what people think, yeah. right? <laughs> As long as you're doing what God's will is, who cares what people think, right? If you're preaching and teaching the truth, and if I say preaching, I'm going to take that word out. If you're proclaiming the truth, and it's the truth, who cares if you're not the best speaker? Didn't you do what God required of you? Lewis, I think I seen your hand next. Knowledge is power. Yep. 
And you know, for long, if you had never studied the Bible, you won't be able to stand here and teach this class. Yeah. You're not going to ever stand it for it because your head is empty. Yeah. And I try to tell that to young kids up the stairs that, you know, don't be ignorant that the scriptures they read it. Yeah. That's lack of knowledge. Knowledge is power. Therefore, when you have knowledge, you can defend and proclaim the scriptures. Yeah. Amen. And that's where I get back to, you know, and you guys have heard me say it from the pulpit, and you've heard me ask the question, are you further along today than you were three years ago? Only you can answer that question for yourself. Are you further along today than you were three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? And that's for you to answer for yourself. You're the one that has to look in the mirror and be able to answer that question. And if you're not, could you be the wicked and lazy servant? Is it inexcusable? I wonder if God would consider it inexcusable that three years, five years, ten years, fifteen years down the road, you're not any further along than you were when you got out of the baptistry. A number of the Lord's parables make that point. Yes. And if we read, more, read them more often, we would understand that we have to be useful in the kingdom. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to get tossed in the fire with the other branches that did not bloom and did not produce fruit. Amen. A number of the parables teach that lesson. Yeah. And just remember, Ed, I got you next. Or God, had, didn't God choose in the beginning, his apostles, didn't he choose just ordinary people? He didn't choose the educated. He didn't choose the elite of the day. He didn't choose the, be the best looking and, 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 and the best, uh, uh, those who had the best ability to, to speak in front of crowds, right? Uh, to spin a story, to tell a joke, right? No, God chose ordinary people to go out and to take his message. And brethren, the old adage holds true, experience is the best teacher. Well, what do I mean about that? I mentioned pilots earlier. Nobody's born a pilot, right? If I read every book that the world contains on the art of being a pilot, and then I jump in the plane and I get behind the control panel, am I able to just go and take off? No. Not with any passengers. Not with it. Yeah, hopefully with no passengers. If I'm going to endanger myself, endanger myself, right? But no, the point is these men and these women, they spend hundreds of hours in flight simulators and practicing their craft before they're entrusted with hundreds of passengers. So it's not enough about just knowledge. You then have to take the knowledge and then you have to put it into practice. So for those who say, but I'm not good at getting up in front of somebody. I don't think I know enough to teach the third grade, the second and third grade children. I don't know enough to teach the high school class. I don't know enough to teach the adult class. Well, brethren, the point is you should have been learning, and if you're not, start today. Amen. Start today to start to learn. Barbara got you next, Ed, and then you. Uh, start to learn, and then the only way to get better is you've got to start actually physically doing it. And that's where in our program we're going to talk about being a silent partner. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Ed and then Barbara. Um, there's a verse that I go to once in a while to read remind myself about all of this. Yep. And it's Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33. Okay. And I, 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 from time to time I read these because I like to look at myself or how am I doing yep. with what we're talking about here. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But, Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So, if we're not out there doing this, are we not denying Jesus? Yeah. Well, and it speaks to also the trust, but it also speaks to, uh, is your fear of the Lord, or is your fear of, is your fear of man? Or, I was just going to say, here at Lincoln Park... When we put a teacher into a classroom, I'm not talking the adult classrooms, I'm yeah, talking yeah. the kids' classrooms, we provide all the materials. Yep. And the less the materials we provide have already been pre-screened, so we know they're scriptural. 
and they give you a million ideas, they give you the story, they give you places to do research. It's the perfect way to begin teaching yeah. some young child because everything is provided. If you can read, you can do this. Yeah. And so that's a situation you don't need to be afraid to jump into and do. It's a yeah. really good way to get started sharing. Because if you share with these kids here, then maybe you'll share with your neighbor's kids. Or, yeah. you know, it can grow from there. But it's a really great learning place. Absolutely. And so, so anybody who's thinking about or, or desiring to teach, like you said, you're given the tools to succeed. If you can read, you can do it. Right? And again, I got you next. And again, if you've gone into the baptistry and you put on Christ in baptism and you've been sitting for any length of time in, in church services, man, it's already out of time. Well, it's been a good class. But if you've been a Christian for any length of time, to say that you can't teach the, the little kids it's the most basic of Bible stories is an excuse. You just don't want to do it. I'd rather have somebody say, hey, I just don't want to do it, than say, I can't do it. Because if you can't do it, that's a problem. Because like Barbara just said, you're given all of the material. If you can read, you can do it. Teaching the adult class takes a little bit more training, takes a little bit more time. But you can do it, right? If you would have told me 15 years ago I was going to be a preacher, and I'd be standing up here on a Sunday morning doing this, probably would have laughed at you. I didn't know a whole lot of nothing 15 years ago. But I had men who were mentoring me, right? And I was learning, and I was studying, right? Anybody could do anything if you put your mind to it and the effort. Um, talking about all this kind of makes me think. Um, you hear people, like, I'm 46, but you hear like older than me yeah. people saying and glorifying how amazing the church was when they were younger and yeah. how there were so many people and we filled the houses and, you know, packed the, the top here and yeah. everything. And I think that that speaks, I mean, a lot of people like to make a lot of excuses, but I think it speaks more <coughs> of the Christians sitting inside the church than it does the world. Yeah. It's our fault. Yeah, it's our fault. Because we've lost track of what our priority is, right? Somewhere along the way, We've been more consumed with the secondary than the primary. We need to get back on track with the primary, and then the secondary will come. I don't, I would like to use myself as an example. Okay. I'm backwards, I'm awkward, I'm unintelligent. These are all facts. I'm terrible, not the smartest person in the world. So I have to study more, and I, I don't think I helped him much, but I even taught Thomas in class. I'm hoping yeah. he survived. Yeah. So. so you're backwards, you're not as smart, and you're awkward, and Thomas is still sitting here and today. He's still sitting here. So, I mean, so, Anybody so, can do it, see? Yeah, no, okay. and, and you can make mistakes yeah. and learn from them and teach yeah. them. Tell the kids you messed up. Yeah. They'll see you're human and respect you more anyway. Yeah. But being I'm just, I mean, I got nothing going for me, but I can do it. Yeah. I just have to study more. So. Yeah, and, and brethren, th this is really all it comes down to. We have to remember that we have to put the work in. The engineer, the pilot, the doctor, the mechanic, right? The plumber, the electrician. Nobody woke up or came out of the womb and had the ability. Jim? Yeah, I was going to say is, uh, it's like, you're willing to walk the first mile, but you're not going to walk the second. Yeah. And then when we just go about the teaching part, I'm probably the slowest person in this auditorium. <laughs> but when we were in Iowa, I talked to young kids on Wednesday night. Yeah. They made me study. Yeah. 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 That's what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, there is, they asked me questions and I couldn't answer them. I said, I will get you the answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, where am I at the rest of the week? I'm in doing it, you know. But you're, amazed, you're amazed at the reward you get from yeah. those kids. Amen. I, at, I was teaching uh, young... Uh, first and second grade. Yeah, first and second grade. And those kids now are 16, 17 years old. Yeah. They're really growing up to me. Nice young person. Absolutely. 
Hey guys, kids are coming. We're out of time. I'm going to just say a prayer, and then we're going to continue this next week. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful and blessed uh, that we have this opportunity to come together and to study your word, to come together as the body of Christ here in Lincoln Park to worship you this morning. We pray that our worship is acceptable in your sight. Father, thank you for all of your answered prayers. We know that the, the prayer list is, is, is extensive at this time, but please continue to be with each of the, those individuals, each of those families uh, who have uh, loved ones who are hurting, and we pray your blessings upon them. We pray for their health and strength to be restored. We pray them for, to be uh, spiritually uh, uh, strengthened. Father, we know you are the, the great physician, the creator, and we just call upon your great and holy name for blessings upon our loved ones. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody.